Okay, well, welcome back. It's Mark Hogan Pritchard here from Emmy Fieldings, and today we are looking at the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Um, we've been teaching some courses on fraud prevention, anti corruption, and one of the topics that we put into the course is a little session on UNCAC, which is the, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Um, I have to say that the, the document itself was was considered a big deal. I think it was back in 2005 in Mexico or somewhere it was ratified at some meeting in the UN. Um, and it was considered to be a big deal by the people who ratified it at that time. My experience now that I have working with people who are in procurement groups and so on in governments all around the world is that it hasn't kind of received the um, the acclaim that I would have expected. And, and the the reason that it hasn't, well, it seems to come from students that they're just not so excited about this thing, is because they don't really understand how to implement it. It's a very, very generic document. What I'm going to do, therefore, as we go through it today, is I'm going to go through it and I'm going to give you some practical examples of what you can actually do to make this thing useful. So let's try, otherwise, because you can just read, in fact, there's a good, little, good few little articles on Wikipedia about this, but, um, but you can just read the thing for yourself and it's not really going to take you very far forward. So, Mark Fields and Pritchard, born out of my experience of teaching this as a topic, um, fraud prevention, anti-corruption. United Nations Convention, 175 countries signed up for it as well. Okay, so the UNCAC has a statement of purpose, and those are your, your three statements of purposes there. So the purposes of this convention are, and you read them for yourself, to promote strength and measures to prevent combat corruption, to promote facilitate and support in international co uh, cooperation, fighting corruption, and to promote integrity. Yeah, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the the objects of the exercise are, are, are fairly straightforward. There, we're really really trying to um, fight corruption. You know, in terms of the United Nations having its overall program of the rule of law, and also the fact that the United Nations really is aiming its its efforts at improving the lives of everyday people in poorer countries, such as in places like Africa. Southeast Asia, the islands of Fiji, South Pacific, um, and in certain areas of South America. But a big bar to this is, is corruption. Um, in some of these economies, 30-40% of the income of the country is being siphoned off into personal individuals' bank accounts. And so the object of the exercise, therefore, is to stop that so that the money goes into the public purse, so that the money then can be spent on infrastructure, and obviously when you start building roads, people have jobs, blah, blah, blah. Um, the whole economic aims. So, so that's the background to what we're trying to do. And you know, if you're just thinking that we're trying to do everything we can to stop corruption, then you're you're really not too far away. Um, this slide, I think, to be honest, as a teacher, looks it looks just kind of like a little bit out of place. It looks a little bit out of place, but it's my effort to bring it back on track rather than just reading great chunks of the legislation. So this is to give you advice when you're looking at actually implementing UNCAC, if you are working in, in an organization in, in you know Ghana or somewhere, because Ghana is putting a lot of effort into fighting corruption, um, what is it that you're actually looking for as you're reading through the document itself? Because it obviously runs to several hundred pages. Um, right, what we're going to do therefore is we're going to go through um, a list, of, a list or in order of the main areas, and there are four main areas that, that the convention looks at. It is, it is worth noting that if you are going to sign up for it, that most of these things therefore are mandatory, while others are strongly encouraged. Um, you know, realistically, at the strongly encouraged phase, if you are in a country and you're looking for donor funding for doing this, please come to us, maybe we can help you with that as well, then at that point you're really going to have to do the strongly encouraged as well. No one like the European Union is actually going to give you money for this. Um, notice as well that most of, the, most of the provisions make some reference to working within the principles of the state's domestic law, and so therefore you do get very, very um, differing interpretations from country to country. Just doing just a quick internet research for a couple of hours before teaching this, and the only country that I really came up with that has, has cut chunks out of it is, is Russia, actually. They've cut out the um, illicit enrichment. Illicit enrichment is when you, you get richer. Uh, by some basis, and then in law it usually means when you're looking at legal systems that you can't justify it. So my salary is $5,000 a month, but I have a Rolls Royce in five different houses and my kids go to school in London sort of thing. Right, that's illicit enrichment. It's this, this idea that you can't justify all the money that you've got. So we've got therefore this idea that we have these contents here, and this is just a background to it. 
but note down which which ones are which. Okay. Um, as far as implementation goes, there is an organization called U4, and it's actually written letter U number four. So just two symbols, U4. And if you go to their website, they do an overview of implementation of UNCAC. Um, the overview, I have to say, as someone who read through it, didn't find it very useful because it makes reference all the way through to the UNCAC checklist, but it doesn't give you the actual checklist itself. Now, to get the checklist itself, you actually have to get some software and download it into your computer. So therefore, if you're going to think about doing this, I think if you're doing a presentation in the office, you need to get one person who's going to get that software, download it onto a machine, and have a look at what it actually explains. Uh, sorry, what it actually requires. But again, it's very, very generic. So don't be put off by that. And in general, and in general, you, you can do this without too much difficulty. <laughs> as long as you have a certain amount of political will and a certain amount of budget. So there'll be certain organizations that you need to open up. So this little slide is an overview. Without going into without going into too much detail, I hope you can read that. It looks very, very small on my screen actually. Um, you know, we're kind of looking for a place to start. So the place I started was prevention because it seems to me that this is the best. Right. We're talking about UNCAC. We're talking about an overview. So the, the first part of UNCAC of the convention itself then talks about prevention. So that, you know, giving the whole game away for what's coming on the next few slides. What measures are we actually taking to prevent corruption from happening? Because this to me, it seems is the most important thing. Rather than trying to catch people after they've stolen money, let's make it as difficult as we possibly can at the start. So the prevention section looks at various areas of that. Um, what can we do to make things transparent? So someone who, who basically started their career as an IPSAS expert in government accounting, you know, transparency that IPSAS drives through this. And of course, what people don't realize is that when they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we want IPSAS because that means that the World Bank will give us money. And then we'll, we'll update the IT system and then the World Bank gives you some money to update the IT system. Of course, when you update the IT system, everything becomes much more transparent and it becomes much harder to steal money. Um, you can still force people to approve invoices and so on. But, but the whole thing does does become harder. So with prevention, things like Ipsos work on a certain level, but you know, setting up anti-corruption bodies, publishing tenders on the internet, going to reverse auctions, uh, publishing details of all major contracts on the internet so that people can see them. All of these things work. And then there's all the stuff that goes hand in hand with it, which is all of the stuff like civil society, so setting or setting up or getting NGOs who look at the government, getting a free and safe press who can question government decisions. Um, and most of this stuff is only governments bringing you in. Yeah? So we get this idea of prevention that, that works on that side. And, and I, that's the side that I like the best because I think prevent, prevention is better than cure, as we say in English. Right, once you've gone through prevention, three other things that we've got there then criminalization. So th that's the kind of punishment side to it. So if you catch people, you go to prison or you lose your jobs, whatever else. So we get this process of making bribery, corruption, and all of those other little things that come around with it, you know, give my brother this contract and then my brother's wife will give your brother a job or something. All of those sort of hand in hand little back pocket rubs that take place. Um, those things as well are all become criminal. So we get the sense that we have criminal courts and so on. And people can go, you know, you know. Right, international cooperation, because obviously what happens is, is that if you are in a country, so let's assume that you steal money from the government of Britain, the first thing you do is transfer the money abroad so that it's not sitting in your bank account in Britain, and it goes to these little countries where we get nice little ideas that people can't see our money. So Switzerland, obviously, but there's other Cyprus, um, and if you're a foreigner as well, Britain's actually quite a good place to put your money. Um, so Belize, Panama, and... and what we would call the offshore zones, which are places where you can hide your money. Offshore companies as well, so you can operate the bank account, but you're not the owner of the business, it can't be traced back to you. Right, international cooperation therefore works together so that if people move from one country to another, they buy assets in another country, they put money in banks in other countries, that they will share information, that they will have extradition treaties, they will send the money back, so on and so forth. And the fourth one, I've put in black there for no obvious reason, is asset recovery. So in asset recovery, this idea that the government will set up a system whereby if you steal money with it, you buy assets, then those assets can come can come back to the state. So those are the four main areas which are covered. 
Okay, so we've done slide number five. Slide number five is the first of two slides which look at prevention. So it says corruption can be prosecuted after the fact, but first and foremost, it requires prevention. So it's a very common sense statement there. Measures directed at both the public and the private sectors. That's an interesting one. Um, the measures of the convention are directed at both. When you work within governments, um, when you work within governments or individual states, you'll find that the, the legislation that they have tends to work one way or the other. The American government, for example, is absolutely crazy about anti-corruption, but once you go outside of the government sector, I wouldn't want to say they leave it to everyone else, but if it's within the country, then it doesn't seem to be too much. If you're an American individual who's involved in bribery scandals outside of America, then once again, the law kicks in with full force. And so they, you get this sense in some countries um, that, that they're not quite evenly matched. If you look, you can go to other extremes. If you go to countries like Ukraine, Ukraine set up this huge anti-corruption bribery department, whole thing totally funded by donors, blah, blah, blah. And then of course what happened was when they set the charter for the thing and they set it aims and objectives, it's only looking at corruption in the private sector. So therefore for the people in the government who are stealing money, they can continue to, to, sleep, to sleep peacefully at night. Uh, model preventative policies, establishment of anti-corruption bodies, enhance uh, transparency in the financing of election and political parties. So these are things again, and well, countries will 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 um, adhere to these rules by various levels. In certain countries, and many many developed countries, certainly the election campaign financing rules in America look to me like something that can be um, could be well do with some sense of revision. Um, model preventative policies, establishment of anti-corruption bodies. One thing as well which I'm very really keen on is putting this into education. I think that anti-corruption should be taught in universities as part of accountancy, economics degrees and so on. Um, because if you get kids at that sort of 17, 18 year old before they come into the work environment and we can make this morally wrong at that level, then, then you'll find that that will filter through later into the process and they will be less likely to do this as they get older. Um, a very good example that we saw in Britain was drink driving. When, when I was a kid, everyone went to the pub, had a few pints and drove home. By making it socially unacceptable to drink and drive, and when, okay, I'm 50 now, but when I was like 17, at that age, I never drank and drive because it just, it was wrong, we didn't do it. Um, and, and now, of course, the younger generation just don't drink and drive either. If we can do the same with corruption, I think that there's a, there's a big way forward there. Right, states must ensure, endeavour to ensure that public services, uh, public services are subject to safeguards, but they must certainly do that. So public bidding procedures and so on. Once again, despite the fact that we've got 175 signatures to this thing, and bearing in mind we've even got places like Palestine, which the UN doesn't recognise as a country, and the European Union, which isn't a country, we should have something in there to ensure that, that public contracts are, are open and transparent. Uh, public servants should be subject to codes of conduct requirements for financial and other disclosures and appropriate uh, disciplinary measures. Notice it's public servants as well here. So for your civil servants, therefore, and usually once you get to a certain level, they have to disclose their assets and their salaries and make those publicly available. Um, obviously, once again, we see the situation where Mr. Public Servant, who's a Prime Minister or Vice Prime Minister, and you know, he's as poor as a church mouse, but his wife is one of the top 30 richest women in the world. So we, we see people getting around it like that. But in principle, this is what's supposed to happen. And then transparency and accountability in matters of public finance. Uh, the judiciary and public procurement. So notice those two there again, judiciary and the public procurement. Um, I got into fraud and corruption by working with the UN in anti-fraud and corruption in public procurement. So but there's a lot of technology out there with this idea of reverse um, auctions, public notice boards and so on. So there's no real reason why this shouldn't be taking place anymore. It, even in third world countries where only 10% of the population have access to um, internet, you can still spread the word. You know, I was working in Liberia. Lots of villages have internet cafes or shops to put an internet in there so people can use this stuff. And you've got the press as well. So we've got this idea of prevention. Before you go on to the next slide with me, make sure that you've read what's on that slide. And, and it seems to me it's all fairly clear. If you're sitting in a government looking at this, you need to make a decision on which of these you're going to do. 
what your political reach is, then where can you have influence and what your budget is? Because these things all cost money as well. Yeah. So slide number six continues in a similar vein. Public services, so people who use some of those voters must expect a higher standard of conduct from their public servants. Um, in what country does that actually take place? I think I know that in Britain now we've currently got people in the 18 to 20, 25 year old demographic are more likely to vote in Britain's Got Talent than they are in elections. Certainly, local elections are getting turnouts 25 percent. Um, there was a great article on the Daily Show here in the United States where it showed that headlines were more popular than Congress. Um, it's what the convention says. The, the, the one thing as well is that when you look at the role of government, certainly if your government is looking to attract funds from the World Bank from the European Union, be they donor funds, be they loans, putting in a good, a nice robust anti-corruption system that helps attract those funds, they so often make more money in the long run than you would do by stealing in the short run. Uh, preventing public corruption requires an effort from all members of society at large. It certainly does. That requires money, and it requires money because you have to have public education programs. Um, again, a country really impressed, that's really impressed me is Ghana. Ghana, the Minister of Finance, comes on every month and says this is what we're doing to fight corruption. People in Ghana will know how realistic, how true, and how well the whole damn thing's working. But he's certainly making an effort, and he's certainly talking about stuff. So, you know, can, at least the guy's doing something. Uh, the Convention calls on governments to promote actively the involvement of non-government community-based organisations. This is really important. Setting up consumer organisations, uh, setting up people who monitor, people who watch, the press and so on, and making sure that there are places where people can go. And finally it says, Article 5 of the Convention enjoins, it's the study, right, isn't it? enjoins each state party to establish and promote effective practices aimed at the prevention of corruption. You, you see how completely general that is. If there's something else which you think in your country would work and would be nice and easy and practical, then do it. That's a, that's a catch-all. And as long as you can show that it's there to design to cut, cut corruption, then that's something that will go on your, your implementation checklist. And you're working inside the confines of all uncut. That's a good thing, yeah. But that's section number one. Remember we talked about that there were four. There's criminalization, there's asset recovery, and there's international cooperation. That's number one, those first two slides on prevention. Anything for prevention. As I said, the one thing that isn't there, which I really do think should be there, is education. I think this should be in universities. And if you do happen to be an accountancy professor, but you think it should be ethics or something should be in your subject, then give us a call and see what we can do. Because we've done stuff for this at other universities in other countries now. So cr criminalisation is, um, at, at the simple level, a fairly obvious topic here. Criminalisation says anything which is bribery and corruption should be made criminal, um, which I guess to surprise some people, but it probably it, it wasn't in many countries, and certain elements of it still aren't in many countries. Um, obviously, if you're going to take a legal system which is in a country which is based around attracting foreign capital, so therefore secrecy rules, so the old was in Switzerland, and you've got countries like Panama and Belize and so on that, that specialise in this stuff. This is a big step for them to actually sign up to this thing, they, they, though they both have signed up. So we get criminalisation. Then what it does is it's like an umbrella. Is an umbrella the right thing? Or like a cone, like a police radar that catches you. As the thing, as the thing spreads out, it goes further. So just have a look at the slides down there in points three and four. So not just the basic, but also things like concealment of money, uh, money laundering, obviously things like perjury will already be um, a criminal offence. Obstructing justice, so refusing to ask questions. Um, and it goes on to this idea of illicit um, enrichment. And for those of you who've come on my course now, you know that we cover what these things are in, in a fair deal of depth. The criminalisation, therefore, what we're looking for is it, what, what the convention is looking for is to see that you anything which is related to bribery and corruption is basically considered to be a crime in your country. Um, if you are looking at implementation, therefore, and some of this stuff isn't, then what you need to do is you need to make it a crime. In terms of writing laws, therefore, there's some pretty good laws around that. For me, obviously, coming from Britain, easy to understand growing up with them. There's the British laws wouldn't necessarily take the American ones, they tend to be very, very large and so on. But the European Union has this stuff as well, so under EU law, so you can just cut and paste those laws and, and then you have to adapt them to your own country legal system and get you through certain legal acts and so on. 
But it's not really a big effort, you know. Go out to bed and go find it. Okay, so I just finished the last slide. Um, I think I said there's one slide on this. There's actually two now, as you can see. I just put the second one in. Um, it's just to go through the just to go through the um, an idea of the stuff that's in in the convention related to criminalisation. So these things which are on the slide are things which will be considered to be criminal criminal acts. Um, this, the the convention itself doesn't actually define corruption, but it does give these as examples. So just to make sure everyone's okay with these, bribery very straightforward. You pay a bribe for someone and get something in return. I'm tendering for a contract to build a road. The guy who makes the decision, I bang fifty thousand bucks in his pocket, and Yahoo, I win the contract. Um, extortion is when we force someone to to give us money. So therefore, with the case of extortion, what we do is we say to the guy, okay, we have some pictures of you with a lady friend, if you don't give us the contract, we're going to show those. That would be an example of extortion. Uh, so we extort the contract from him, or we show him his drugs or something like that. So extortion is this idea where we are getting something from him. Um, and it doesn't just have to be compromising pictures where he's done something wrong. It could also be purely the situation where we will harm you, physical damage. Um, in, in many countries, being a procurement official for the government is really quite a hazardous job. Uh, collusion, so collusion, so myself and my two brothers get together and we all tender for a contract and then on the very, very last minute my two brothers pull out and I'm the only person left who I get. It. That's collusion. This idea where we are working together, either tenderers are working together or the purchasers can be working together with us. Yeah. Um, so that's collusion, where you're working with someone else to, to gain an unfair advantage. Uh, fraud is the situation where I hold myself out to be something that I'm not. So I'm a doctor and I've performed many, many operations. Please give me $100,000 and I will advise you on medical matters. Um, I'm not a doctor. I've never performed any operations in my life. And there are a few people less well qualified than me to provide medical advice. So fraud is this idea that I pretend to be something that I'm not. And so you get fraud in, in statements. You get fraud in financial statements as well, changing financial statements. Um, embezzlement, which for wherever I took this slide from, has decided to give you the um, definition, is misappropriation of property. So therefore for embezzlement, um, and we, we see this a lot, you, you see this a lot, you know, I am a vice minister working in the Ministry of Public Libraries or something, I get a nice car, I decide that I'm going to leave and go and be a consultant for some company, but you who I think I'll take the car with me. That's embezzlement. So the idea is that I am misappropriating property. Abusive function, ab abusive function, which is a wonderful phrase, isn't it? I'm sure there are videos on this. Um, abusive, abusive function is this idea that I use my job to do something that I shouldn't do. Um, very, very simple thing. I used to see this. This is driving me crazy in Russia. So lots of people, um, huge traffic jams in Moscow, and guys who were, God only knows what, something in the government, you know, the, the, the vice minister for public toilets, and the guy would decide that he didn't want to sit in the line. So he would put the blue light on, you know, the blue light like a police car, and then he would drive all down the emergency and he'd force everyone else off the road just so he didn't have to sit in a traffic jam every day. Um, and it was a, a favourite hobby of uh, these Russian TV programmes. They used to stop these cars in the morning and then demand to know who these people were. So uh, abusive function, this idea where I, I, I get something, you know, um, and, and that, that something comes from me using my position. There's a company that wants to open a shop and they need a licence. They're going to sell TVs. So bingo, I get a couple of free TVs in my house and they get the licence that they require. Abusive function. And finally, illicit enrichment. Um, and this is something that varies from country to country with how serious they take this. I already mentioned that Russia refused to put this into their laws. Uh, illicit enrichment simply means that I have a job, I earn a thousand bucks a month, but I own a house that's a million dollars and uh, three or four very nice cars. Where did they come from? Um, if you can't explain and show where that stuff came from, then you are guilty of something because you must have got the money from somewhere. If you have a rich uncle or a rich wife, husband, boyfriend, whatever, then fine, that's where the money came from. You won the lottery, bingo, that's where the money came from. 
Um, if you can't explain where the money came from, then you're guilty of something. And that's, that's basically how the convention works. Um, it's also how tax law works. If you have all of these things, a statement, what they call tax law in Britain, they will prepare a statement of assets. And don't forget that in many, many countries, Britain, Russia as well, um, under tax law, you are guilty until proven innocent. So it's your job to prove yourself innocent. Right, so in, in illicit enrichment is this idea that I have more than I should have based on my salary. Where does it come from? If I can't explain it, then I'm guilty of corruption. No, you have to build a case. And the effort that people put into building that case depends on who they are and where they are. International cooperation um, is something that I have to be honest, I've never done in real life. I just read the books on it. And when you read the books, it's a very, very short section. Basically, it talks about um, extradition of people. So if you have two countries, Britain wants to get someone and that person is in Russia, then Russia will fess up the person and send them back extradition. If they are found guilty in, in the Russian courts, but they're British nationals, we can send them back and transfer them back. And finally, that all of the countries will work together as well in terms of provision of information. So therefore, they'll swap information backwards and forwards. Again, as a textbook exercise, therefore, it's fairly short. My expectation is that in real life, it is hugely not short and massively long. But, but that's the situation that we have. You can see on the slide, therefore, so they will cooperate with one another in every aspect of the fight against corruption, including prevention, investigation, prosecution of, of offenders. They are bound specific forms of mutual um, legal assistance, including transferring evidence and, and offenders. And they will support with measures to, tra to trace assets, free, secure, blah, 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 confiscate assets. Um, as a theoretical exercise, therefore, very, very simple. As a practical exercise, I imagine an utter nightmare. So this one is asset recovery. Um, again, asset recovery is a difficult one. It, it's been criticised in real life, or various states have been criticised in real life. Some countries just don't put that much effort into getting it back, or the amount of effort they put into it tends to be um, a political decision. On the other hand, other countries, such as the United States of America, have been heavily criticised for putting too much emphasis on this. So you're accused of corruption, you're shy a couple of thousand bucks, you can't show where that money came from, and bingo, the next thing is your house, your car, and your kidneys have gone. So um, asset recovery is something that, that needs uh, a fair bit of effort and a little bit of balance and common sense. And again, these things have a tendency to be, to be discretionary. Um, again, if you look at a country like the United States, if you're in a regional court, for example, then what can be happening as well is that if the local council depends on recovering funds from fines, and let's remember that some towns in the United States get 60% of their town revenue from municipal violations. They can be a little bit overzealous. So what does the convention itself actually say? Specifies cooperation how it will work. In the case of embezzlement of funds, confiscated property will be returned to the state requesting it. But remember if it's money, for example, and you've taken it abroad, this means, therefore, if you're a Brit, you know, the Russians, the money's in Russia, the Russian authorities have to seize that money. And then having seized it, they have to pay it back to the British government. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a fairly big deal, because for a government, you've got to persuade the seizing government that you as a government are fair and have a right to this. Um, and that will they may have concerns about that, particularly if it's one of their own citizens. Um, and secondly, then politics will kick in as well. Where we are at the moment, it's unlikely that Russia is going to be seizing money and paying it back to the United States of America. Um, in the case of proceeds of any other any other offence covered by the Convention, you, see you have to provide the proof of ownership or recognize, recognition of the damage. And bearing in mind, if you're the British government, you're going to have to meet the Russian standards of proof. Going that way around, it probably isn't that difficult, but possibly going, going the other way around, it would be. Um, even now, we've still got cases going on, what, 70 years after the end of the war, that Jewish people trying to recover assets they lost during the war. In other cases, priority consideration is given to the return of confiscated property to request return of confiscated property to the requesting state and the return of this to the prior legitimate owners or the compensation to the victims. Um, presumably, therefore, if you've stolen it from the municipality of uh, Ekaterinburg, then the municipality of Ekaterinburg must have the documents, the ability and the legal standing to prove that it was the owner of that money. Otherwise, the foreign country just won't transfer it back. And that probably, in reality, 
it's going to save a lot of people because it may not be as easy to do um, as you can, uh, as, it, as it might be. Yeah. Right, that's asset recovery, which is, that's the fourth one. Yeah. So th this slide really just, just says more of the same, to be honest, let's get to this quite quickly then. So the effect is that it supports companies. So this is a statement, this is typical UN in your first paragraph, it's saying this is what they're actually trying to do. And, and the object of the exercise is to help companies get, help countries get their assets back. Um, bearing in mind, it does also affect public organisations. So if you've stolen from a company in Russia and transferred the money to Britain, for example, then you'll still get caught under the, under the same principles. Uh, according to Article 51, return of assets to countries of origin is a fundamental principle of this convention. So it, it, it's really putting a lot of stress on that. That's, that's UN speak for saying this is important, rather than just putting in bold or italics. And article number 43 obliges state parties to use the widest possible cooperation. Because obviously so much of this depends on goodwill and interpretation and so on. Um, right, the last part is important. And, and once again, this is something that has come up. It's where the country that claims that the money has been stolen says this is a crime under the paragraph section of our law. And then the country that the person has fled to and taking the money with them doesn't consider it to be a crime. Um, pretty much in that situation, it has to be a crime in both countries for this to be valid. But notice, that, and this is what it's saying here, is it, the crime which is exactly the same crime in country number one. Sorry, the, the, the crime in crime number one does not have to be the same crime in crime number two. So the, the theft of money could be considered to be theft of money, which is a crime in in Britain, but it could be embezzlement in Russia. But even though they are different crimes that cover the same offence, they, they are both crimes. And so what it's saying is it's allowing allowing this broad match between legal structures. Um, it, it will come into play, you know, where certain where certain items cover prison sentences and so on, where you've got differences between civil crimes and criminal cases. Though bearing in mind it should always be a criminal offence under the criminalisation principles of the of the, stand, of the of the treaty, but what what they're trying to do is that they're trying to say is that you know you have a defendant, a guy who stole money in Russia and transferred the money to Britain. The first thing is that the Russians have to show that this is a criminal offence. Then the Brits have to show it's a criminal offence. Then they have to show all of the ownership. Then they have to show who actually the assets belong to, where they came from, why they were taken, in what capacity. And, and if, if at some stage lawyers will argue, well, you don't have the right to send this money back because it's not crime in our country, what this guy's done. So, or, or it's the crime that they've said that it is. They're saying he is guilty of whatever the crime was in Russia. That crime doesn't exist or that we have a different level of, of crime um, in our own country. And so, so the lawyers would tie the whole thing in knots, basically, to, to keep the guy out of prison. And if he's stolen enough money, they know that they're going to get paid from the proceeds of his criminal of the criminal activity. Right, the whole point of the treaty is just to draw a line through that and just say, right, just ignore all this crap. If a guy stole the money in Russia, seen as a crime in England, send the money back. Yep. So I just, just picked up uh, a couple of little criticisms here from the internet and from people I've been speaking to. Um, as I said, the, the main criticism that I would really like to see is I'd like to see this plugged into the education system. And I think that should be a priority because if you can get a kid who is 16, 17 years old, who haven't been physically exposed to corruption and they don't understand that it's possible to steal money. But we can take those young minds and we can make this as a socially unacceptable crime in those minds. Then I think that will be a, a huge way of challenging this. And if we teach them that there should be a free press, this should be discussed in the press. Young kids, even those growing up, you know, Burkina Faso, the Cook Islands or wherever, they know what the internet is. They have on the internet websites. And, and you know, there's transparency in purchasing decisions now. Look at sites like Amazon. So why can't we have transparency in government purchasing decisions? We can see the names of the government officials, declarations of what assets they've got at the start of the year and the end of the year. And, and once you start putting systems in place and you make the whole thing transparent, it just really becomes impossible to steal after that. And, and that's really what we're aiming for. Let's just make it as hard as we can. And then people will just settle down. Most of these people in most of these countries, um, and, you know, and when I say most of these countries, I mean every country in the world, um, they're well paid for. So that should be enough for them. Right, other things that are on the slide then, here we go. So it doesn't really talk about political corruption. Um, you know, th this is a big one that you, you get access 
by being the head of the government procurement department, that that is a job where you get voted in. So therefore, you can control the newspapers to say what a great guy you are. You can control if it's some government committee. You can control the government committee by ensuring that they get kickbacks as well. And so there's there's a little little bit of a shortage there in in terms of um, dealing dealing with the government and government government corruption and so on. And then it talks about political financing as well. Um, political financing is, is a huge issue as well. I mean, we we see this in the United States where I have to be honest, I'm not an American, so I don't know the strict rules. But my impression is just watching. American TV is that arms manufacturers, cigarette companies, companies that produce all of this genetically modified food that produce allergies in children, they all seem to be able to fund the government. And of course, once you're in the government, then then that's it. You know, you, that's the threat, isn't it? Next time I put all my money behind the other guy's campaign. And I, I think as well, there's, I certainly was reading an article this morning that they, there was some in the um, Ford Progressive, which is the Democratic Party newspaper, was complaining that in some places it's almost the other way around now. Politicians are saying to companies, if you don't back me, then we'll get law that stands against you. Then we'll, we'll set up laws that stand against you. So that's a bit of a shame. You can see why it happened, though. The guys who've got to sign this into law are going to sign a law that restricts where they get their campaign financing from. Welcome to the world. So there you go, that's uh, an overview of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Um, I hope that made it a little bit more accessible, um, God forbid, and a little bit more interesting for you. It's um, something, as I said, it's been signed by something, I forgot, 175 different organisations, countries around the world, and it includes parties which are not members of the UN. So the Cook Islands, I know, is not a member of the UN. Palestine is not. The European Union obviously is a country, so it can't be a member of the UN either. But they've all ratified this thing as well. Um, it's something which I think is really important because, once again, it's a document that people use as a benchmark. If you're sitting in a country and you're looking at, you know, getting a little bit of budget, spending some money on this stuff, then that's a really nice fallback document you've got because you can say, well, we're doing this. We're doing it um, in line with the United Nations Convention. And, and it gives you automatic credibility as far as it goes. Um, the document itself is fairly generic. So I think maybe what we'll do next time then is we'll do one of these little videos and we'll do it on um, actual implementation. I wanted to put more implementation into this, but it just makes the thing too damn long. People aren't going to sit through a two hour video. Um, and then the checklist itself also is actually a case of where you have to get hold of the damn thing and you have to buy it, get it software, download it. And it really is just a massive task, which is too long just for a 30 minute video. But there is the UNADC guide, which gives you um, the guide to you uncack in public procurement. So everybody do that. Right, if you haven't made it this far, I congratulate you on sitting all the way through this. Thanks very much for listening. Please, if you've got any questions or you want anything else, come to us on the website, come to us on YouTube. Other than that, thank you very much. And the sun's come out while I've been doing this. It's a beautiful day.